This time on Legal Logic, we'll be taking a closer look at race and the law. The founders of this country made a commitment to establishing a government that would guarantee to all individuals the rule of law and security for liberty under the law. As the country we live in is only getting more diverse, how do we ensure that the safety provided by our legal system and courts of law is available and equitable for all? Hello and welcome to Legal Logic. I'm Bonnie Richardson and I'll be hosting today's program. Today we'll be discussing race and the law and I'm joined by several members of Oregon's legal community who bring a wealth of first-hand knowledge about the topic with them. First I'd like to introduce Judge Adrian Nelson, Multnomah County Circuit Court Judge. And over here to my left is Simon Wong. He's the Deputy City Attorney for Portland. He's also the past president of Oregon Asian Pacific American Bar Association. And finally, Ramon Pagan, attorney and president of the Oregon Hispanic Bar Association. Thank you all for joining us today. My pleasure. So Sorry. I want to start by first asking you, Simon, um, why, why is it that we're still dealing with race and our justice system today? Well, um, first, before I say anything, I do have to give a disclaimer. Uh, even though I'm a deputy city attorney, I'm not here on behalf of the city attorney's office or the city of Portland, and my views are my personal views alone. Um, with respect to race, uh, I think I don't think we have to go any further back than uh, a couple months ago in Ferguson and what happened to realize that it's still a very visceral and very important topic and that uh, there are great inequities that still exist in both society and also in the justice system. And you have Trayvon Martin from a year or two ago. It seems like every year or two there is some searing event that really shows that race is something that's important to America and to Americans and everyone has very different views and perspectives on it. Yeah, I, I, mean, I want to get into that a little bit. Um, you know, we're seeing this now all over the media. I mean, we haven't seen a whole lot in Oregon, but why, why is it that we're having this happen in Ferguson and people are reacting the, the way that they are? Ramon, you want to jump well, in? <clears throat> I think it, it starts with some large case or some large event, but what will happen is some large event will bring out the institutional uh, fractures that we have in this society and how uh, people of a certain race uh, are being treated or perceived to be being treated differently in the court systems. And sometimes those perceptions are true. So Ferguson, for instance, uh, brings out the relationship that the black community has with the law enforcement. Um, it also brought out, uh, for a lot of people, the tension in terms of how differently, say, uh, the young man who was shot, Mr. Wizard Brown, yes. uh, versus how, say, they're treating the officer, you know, uh, in terms of his legal protections and what legal protections did he have. So uh, these events, you know, they become microcosms, but they shed a light on something that's far greater and institutional for us. And I also think it's because it helps people remember that while there have been strides made in terms of civil rights that were going back, I can recall when uh, there was the rioting and the outcry in Ferguson, it was very close to the anniversary of the Civil Rights Act being uh, enacted and the precipitous for all of that was the marching and the riots and when you saw pictures that were put side by side 1964 mm. of the dogs mm. being released on people the, the, the some of the looting and also the militarization of the police and then you showed pictures of what happened in Ferguson they were different yet the same the difference were the people had different clothes but the mm -hmm. feeling and the intensity was the same yeah. Also, I would say that, uh, I mean, the seminal racial event um, of my youth was the L.A. riots after Rodney King. And if you think mm -hmm. about, you know, what you were saying about how it's a microcosm of society and it takes one event that reflects these mm -hmm. deeper pressures and prejudices and um, difficulties that, that exist. I mean, it just takes an event like that to really kind of illustrate how tough race is as an issue, yet how important it is yes. right now. Let's, um, we'll talk about that some more later. Um, thanks for those comments. But um, I think this might be a good time. Let's take a look at it from a historical perspective. 
and how some of these protections afforded everyone under the law came into place. So let's go ahead and roll that clip. The Constitution of 1787 and the Bill of Rights of 1791, as originally written, did not outlaw slavery and discrimination because of race and gender. That most American ideal of equal rights under the law did not happen until after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment of 1865 banned slavery. The 14th Amendment of 1868 guaranteed equal rights of citizenship to all Americans with the express purpose of protecting the rights of former slaves. And the 15th Amendment of 1870 provided that voting rights of citizens shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Despite the promise of the 14th Amendment, most black Americans did not enjoy equal protection of the laws until well into the 20th century. Jim Crow laws enforced racial segregation in the South until the 1950s. The turning point came in 1954 with Brown versus the Board of Education outlawing segregation in public schools. And a year later, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a public bus to a white man and was arrested for breaking a city ordinance in Montgomery, Alabama. In 1957, Martin Luther King Jr. and others set up the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as a leading engine of the civil rights movement. The landmark piece of civil rights legislation came with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited discrimination of all kinds. Welcome back to Legal Logic. It always amazes me that it took until the 1960s for the Civil Rights Act to be passed, and now we're looking at you know how far have we progressed since then. Um, so I want to talk about that. Maybe start with Judge Nelson. Um, you know, here we are in Oregon. Oregon has quite a history of some pretty bad race history that a lot of people don't know about. I want to kind of start off with you and some comments from you about that. Well, Oregon does have a unique history. Um, it was the only free state ever admitted with an exclusion law. While it abolished slavery, blacks were not allowed to live here. And the, if you stayed here, there was a whip law where you could get lashes. It was enacted in 1844. It was uh, repealed. And there's a question of whether it was meaningfully meant to be repealed or repealed by accident. But before it was repealed, it was modified to a financial penalty. You would have to pay $50 instead of getting the lashes. In the so, 1800s? In the 1800s. I what that was which like. clearly had a chilling effect on blacks moving and remaining mm -hmm. in the state. And therefore, there's an explanation why the population percentage is low as it is today. Yeah, let's talk about that. So I just want to make sure the audience understands. So black exclusion law. So Oregon had an exclusion law excluding blacks from the territory of Oregon. Absolutely. Well, and let's not also forget Asian exclusion laws in Oregon as well. Rich history of that. Absolutely. Uh, that Asians couldn't own property. Asians mm -hmm. were not allowed in city mm -hmm. limits uh, um, beyond a certain curfew. Um, and of course, there was uh, the internment during World War II. I mean, mm -hmm. you have this type of behavior from like decades ago, and I think you still see some of the effects really even today. I mean, Portland's a pretty white place compared to our neighbors to the north and our neighbors to the south, Seattle and San Francisco, and it's like they are much more diverse. They didn't have those kind of exclusion laws, and um, it's one of the explanations, I think, for why we still remain a relatively white mid-sized city. And there was not that organized effort to move neighborhoods around, you know. Uh, with the Vanport flood and the displacement of so many of the people of color who had come to work in the shipyards, then when the blacks relocated, created a community where it's now Memorial Coliseum, it was dismantled and they were moved over to Albina in the need for the Memorial Coliseum as well as the highway. And then after uh, Albina got to be so large, they made different laws come into effect. They changed Union Avenue. They changed uh, what is now known as Martin Luther King, made it a highway. There was a lot of um, disintegration of the families. People who had lived over in Emanuel in anticipation of that hospital expansion in the 70s that just happened earlier mm -hmm. in the 2000s. 
2010s were displaced again. Mm -hmm. So there has been an effort, not just for blacks, but for Asians, for Latinos, for a variety of groups that just has caused Oregon to be the way it is. Mm. Yeah, I wonder what kind of effect that has and what it's going to now. I mean, now that you're talking about Latinos, I don't mean to mm -hmm. point to you, Ramon. Um, I know you, you came from um, New York, I think, is where you mm -hmm. were first starting out practicing. Mm -hmm. And uh, but so, you know, very diverse. You came here to Oregon. What did you think when you first moved here? Well, it's interesting. Uh, coming here, I actually had, you know, friends in New York who asked me why. Uh, and, you know, noting that there were so few Hispanics here, and I would joke with them, well, they're getting one more. So it, doesn't, it didn't intimidate me. And, you know, I think for me personally, um, one of the thoughts that I've always had about places or institutions with some sort of historical, uh, you know, discrimination or some, some, some sort of black mark on their record for the way that they treated minorities is that if they are trying to change I think we should, as a community, reward them for that, you know, and not kind of punish them for their past. Mm -hmm. And I think Oregon is a good example of a, a state that has uh, a pretty conscientious um, citizenry that do want to change, that do mm -hmm. want to be progressive, uh, but they're dealing with the effects of having that history and the low amount of you know, the population of minorities and how to deal with that. But I just growing don't, th up. I think we should, yeah, it's growing and I think we should encourage, you know, uh, people to try to come here and say, look, you know, whatever it was 50 years ago or even 30 mm -hmm. years ago, uh, the people are conscientiously trying to change it in a better way. So it is a good place to live for minorities. They just need to engage and try it out. Well, yeah. I think the problem is that the hipsters are all coming over here. <laughs> they tend to be predominantly white, so that's yeah, well, also there is not that. really helping the yeah. racial diversity pool. Well, gentrification is an issue, and it's the, it, an issue that really gets to the heart of what we're talking about with race. A lot of people are concerned about affordable housing, so you will go to an area that has a place that can help you have your part of the American dream, and what do you do with your desire to have that American dream and also understanding the history of how that neighborhood may be affordable to you, it puts each individual in this kind of a conflict in which need is going to rise to the top. Your sense of we need to make sure that everyone has equal and fair access to everything or I'm trying to get what I need for myself and we'll deal with that other issue later. No, you also have the problem of gentrification here, though. I mean, you have Absolutely. these areas, say, in northwest Portland that maybe even 15 years ago were like urban areas that were pre predominantly African-American, and now they are Absolutely. Uh, turning into places where yuppies are moving in, and the racial minorities are getting displaced out further into, say, East Portland. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and is there more of a segregation that we're seeing, though, with that? Is it, um, what about, um, for example, one of the fastest growing populations, Hispanics? Mm -hmm. Lots of Hispanics that are moving into our communities mm -hmm. and making our communities more diverse. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of impact is that having on us? Here? Well, I, I, you know, segregation is one way of looking at it, but also, I, you know, I come from a place where uh, they, we call them ghettos or barrios, right? Uh, and sometimes people think of that as a negative, but in a certain sense, uh, it's going back to a neighborhood where you feel welcome. And so they gather, we gather in places where we walk outside and we speak the same language as someone else where we get the same food that we would, that our mother cooked for us, you know, uh, in our representative country. And some people kind of look at that as a negative. Um, and again, you know, I think diversity is uh, an enrichment. And so the more neighborhoods that we get like that, I, I think people need to redefine whether or not that's segregation for themselves or just a, a gathering of a, per, of a people with a certain culture and are that it's the, something to embrace. Are there any neighborhoods like that here in Portland though, in the Latino community? I, I, I think you could find them absolutely depending, you know, again, when you go out east, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, what about uh, in Hillsborough? East Portland, yeah, you yeah, got to head all the absolutely. way out to Hillsborough yeah, before yeah. you, mm -hmm. you know, you hit something like that. Well, it, but property. when you go out further, it's it's easier to form that because then there's no financial barrier to creating that right. neighborhood. So it allows for the full 
range of people to live there. I suppose. I w I and, you know, part of this too, I think this is going to be maybe after our next clip, I want to hear all about your own personal um, oh. experiences because you all represent, um, you know, various um, portions of our community and it's important to have that face. But on this next clip, um, we've asked several members of our legal um, community how they became involved as lawyers and judges and also the perceptions that people have of the judicial system. One of the things that, uh, that really made me, motivated me to, to the bench was the fact that there were, for, there was for a long period of time, no uh, Latino lawyer on the bench. And so law for me was a way to reclaim some power. Um, I think lawyers have incredible tools to be able to go into court and change lives and change behavior in a legal, organized way. And, and that's really what drove me to law school and to being a lawyer. And after practicing for 25 years uh, and uh, appearing in front of uh, all 38 judges in Multnomah County, I thought that uh, uh, that I would bring some diversity to the bench, uh, but I, I thought uh, being a judge that I could make a difference, especially in the lives of young African-American men that appear before me. I always noted that sense of um, discomfort when they would enter into a court and uh, see that between the jury and the judge and the prosecutor and, and the other representatives in the courtroom, I, that person and I were the only Latinos and definitely the only Spanish-speaking people. It's not uh, unusual for people to say to me that I don't believe the system's going to treat me fairly, especially when I was a lawyer. They would come to me and say, I'm never going to get treated fairly. The, the juries are all from East County. They, they don't relate to my background or my culture. There is that perception of the minority community that um, if you come to court, you won't get justice. It's a perception. I don't, in Multnomah County, I don't believe it's a reality. Welcome back. I'd like to ask one of our panelists, Ramon Pagan, um, criminal defense attorney. You know, what motivated you to become involved to the degree that you have become involved in the legal system? Well, um, you know, I again, I come from New York, so it's a little different for me um, because I think I'd always seen uh, Hispanics or blacks or Asians in positions of power by the time I'd grown up. So. For me, I visualized that it was okay, that that, that was doable. Um, and, you know, seeing people become judges, federal judges, prosecutors, elected positions, things of that nature. So I was, in a sense, lucky uh, for that. And that affected me to have the confidence to do that. And then, you know, when you go to law school, many people have different reasons for going to law school. And they really don't really know the system, I don't think, that well. And I, I think as you mature, in your career, you start really seeing how the system works. Um, and you hope that the conscientious people, uh, as they go through their career, start wanting to make it better. And I think that's where I am, where I've seen it work, I've seen it not work, uh, I've seen people not have access to justice, uh, I've seen people have more access than maybe they deserved, <laughs> depending on how much money they had. And uh, so I think that's where I am now is I've seen enough. I've seen it in New York. I've seen it in other jurisdictions. I've come to Oregon and seen the unique uh, judicial system that we have here because of our population uh, that it's made me concerned. Mean, you mean like all, almost all white? Well, no, because you know what? In, in Oregon still, uh, like many other jurisdictions, one of the unfortunate things that you'll see is that many of the defendants in the criminal justice uh, system have uh, an ethnic last name yes. or they're black. Uh, you know, I think the stat that, that came out recently that said, what, 40 to 50 percent of black males under the age of 23 will be arrested mm -hmm. and go through the judicial system at some point, you know, by the time they're 23. That's, that matters. So. Those types of stats and kind of seeing that happen, representing enough people from an underrepresented community makes you want to give back more, as much as you can. I, you know, something that struck me about Judge <coughs> Lopez, that, you know, right now we don't really represent all the people that are um, at the higher up of our profession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Judge Nelson. You're one of two African Americans judges in the, the state. state. In the state. In the state, and I'm the wow. second female in Oregon's history. And wow, yes, and it's you're, a sobering statistic when I tell it to people. They yes. look around and say, 
Really? Second black female. The second black female okay. in the history. Yeah. And, and so, you know, what does that what does that do for people that come into your courtroom? Now, now you come across very, you know, you're you have a very nice, warm, welcoming, um, you know, but you're a person of color. Um, how does that impact a person that walks into the system? They look around, everyone around them is white, but they see you up there. I mean, how, how do you think that impacts? I've had a number of people tell me that it makes a difference. And I feel that my courtroom does feel differently. Um, mm -hmm. My courtroom is very vibrant with the type of art that I have from the public arts collection through the Regional Arts and Cultural Com Commission. It talks about social issues. I don't shy away from it. I'm an African-American woman from the South who has an accent. So we can't act as if that I'm something that I'm not, not that I want to, I embrace it. And by being myself, I encourage other people to understand that they can be themselves and we're gonna make our system work as best as it can be. Everyone seems to understand that they'll have an opportunity to be heard. They may not get the result they want because everyone can't win, but at least they feel like the system works a little bit better with someone who reflects them or reflects someone that they can identify with. Because I've had a number of people who aren't of color, who are young women or people from lower socioeconomic uh, status come and say, it made me feel better to mm -hmm. see you in here. Mm -hmm. I agree with that wholeheartedly, having been in your courtroom, um, and I appreciate that. I I'm going to turn, and um, Simon, you've tried cases in Oregon. You've had to go in other counties. Mm -hmm. you, know, you were the only minority, um, and you're the person that's up there speaking. You're speaking to a whole white jury. I think you had a recent case. We don't have to talk about what that is, but, you know, what was your perception? How did that impact your it was very different. I mean, when I was a prosecutor in Manhattan, where it was a very diverse, uh, well, everything, juries and, um, and population, then... And office. And office, yeah. Race didn't, um, really, race didn't really seem to matter so much, except for if it was, you know, um, it, they're making an allegation that you are striking the blacks from the jurors, something called a Batson challenge. Like, if that, that was where it might come into play. That's um, unconstitutional too. Yes, it yes. is, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but uh, but race was kind of always all around in a sense. I mean, it, it reflected into, say, um, the skepticism uh, that uh, juries would have against police because there was several uh, misconduct, like really severe misconduct by, by police officers and it becomes a black and white issue. Here in Portland um, or elsewhere in Oregon, I guess I happen to be the Asian lawyer, the Asian prosecutor uh, who is doing a case, but race didn't really seem to play much of a factor. But I think, you know, that's partly sadly because almost every participant in the process was white. The judge, the jurors, the defendants, the attorneys. And so to the extent that it had any bearing whatsoever, it's just kind of a you notice that there is someone of color on the jury, but it doesn't really become anything that's too much of an issue. So uh, what did I, maybe to wrap this up about access to justice, I mean, what can we do to make sure that there's more access to justice? You, we've heard about how you can make your courtroom more welcoming to everyone of all socioeconomic classes. Um, what are some of the things that lawyers can do? Well, we want do? people, what, what lawyers can do is what the citizens can do, and that's come to the courthouse when you receive your jury summons and serve. Mm -hmm. It is really important that juries are as reflective of the community as possible because jury verdicts make a difference to lawyers. It affects how you assess a case, it affects maybe how the strategy you use, and it also affects settlement of cases mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. cases are resolved. So the more diverse uh, voices, the better. And I know that it is a personal sacrifice for people to come in and serve, but every juror I've ever talked to, because I talk to jurors to get feedback for their attorneys so that they can improve and hone their skills, as well as get a feeling for how they felt about the process, often say, I may not have wanted to be here, but I'm really glad I was here by the end of the experience. Mm -hmm. And I understand why it's so important that the community voice its a p collective opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, we'll talk a lot more about juries here in a minute. I think there's another clip we'll watch on that. But, you know, just by having the jury system in place, that gives people access to justice. So it's not just one person making a decision. It's a group of people from our community. Um, so it seems that there are systems in place to ensure people have access to justice. However, there's some very alarming statistics out there about the percentages, I think uh, Ramon was mentioning this, of racial and ethnic minorities in the criminal justice system. So let's roll through this clip and uh, then we'll talk about some of our thoughts on this subject. In the whole state, there's 173 circuit court judges. Uh, I, I would think 30 to 40 percent of defendants that come through and criminal charges through Multnomah County are African American. I think it starts with law enforcement. Law enforcement has to be trained that just because a guy has sagging pants or, or a cap on that he's not automatically involved in criminal activity and that's not a basis to suspect him. As a judge I do see uh, inordinate number of percentages of uh, people of color coming to me being convicted of crimes and, and my having to sentence them. And that troubles me, you know, that is troubling to me. And I think the greater problem is a lack of uh, adequate education, lack of adequate nourishment when they're children to be able to, to do well in school and pay attention in school, lack of viable job opportunities, uh, which results in a uh, socioeconomic disparity. Now that being said, the other uh, overrepresented group of people I see in my courtroom are um, or white people. Welcome back. So we have two related but distinct thoughts from those interviews. Um, Judge Nelson, I want to ask you, how might we reverse this trend of overrepresentation of minorities in the judicial system? First of all, we have to acknowledge that there is an overrepresentation and then have those hard conversations that we need to address. How does that occur? Often, People are in the legal system because of interactions they've had with law enforcement, because of where they live, they may be targeted more, because of lack of access to housing, education. This is a continuum that starts from birth. There is a whole discussion about the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. So there's an acknowledgement that if a child is not given the resources that is needed by age five, you are really giving some indication based on what resources, the type of uh, uh, community, the type of network, the type of not necessarily family that that child has is an indicator if that child is going to be more likely to be in the legal system or not, particularly if it's a child of color. Mm -hmm. It is a big concern. Um, Ramon, I mean, how do, what do you feel about this given your experience? Um, I mean, you um, know, I, I think we have to re examine also uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think we have to re examine the drug war too mm -hmm. and the, the effect of the drug war on the minority populations. It, it becomes kind of a, a self fulfilling cycle where you know they they say that the black neighborhood or the Hispanic neighborhood is an area of high crime so they send more cops so they find more people with drugs on them and so there's more crime so they can say it's a high crime neighborhood and, but the statistics show that the percentage of use amongst you know spread across the races is static you know, the, the, it, the, it's not that 80% more black people mm -hmm. use drugs or Hispanic people use They're drugs. They're just getting prosecuted They're just more? getting prosecuted. They're getting caught more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, I think the, the country is starting to come around to re-examining this problem. Uh, you know, the idea of for-profit prisons is a problem. The idea of the probation system that we've put into place with drugs and those types of crimes and kind of the revolving mm -hmm. door system. There's a lot of kind of institutional ideas that were born out of the 70s and 80s that people thought were really going to work and now we're kind of 20, 30 years out from it and it hasn't made life better um, and it has destroyed neighborhoods. It's destroyed whole communities um, and so I think the cost-benefit analysis for those 
types of you know mandatory minimums for drugs and, and you know first offense things of that nature need to be seriously reexamined. It has a huge effect when you know you're a, a person of color and your father's 28 years old and he gets caught with a drug and gets a mandatory minimum that puts him in for five years or something like that. And now you've you know completely destroyed that family in terms of now it's a single mother. Now the child doesn't have a father, the financial resources are lower, et cetera. So I, I think there's a, a lot of institutional ideas that need to be reexamined across the nation. Do you do nation. that through the legislature? Or, you know, is that probably the best way? I mean, you know, how do we do that through the court system? Well, through the court system, I, you know, that's, it's a little more difficult, but I think people need to understand that that's why that's happening. And through the court system, it specifically, I think it's law enforcement. Uh, is, is actually the idea. Yeah, well, you know, the judges yeah. are doing their job. The other thing, in the court system, we need more diversity mm -hmm. on the bench. We need more diversity at the prosecutor's office. Uh, you know, we need, if you're going to be in a position of authority with uh, and affecting multiple types of communities, I think as an office, uh, if you're, you know, the elected prosecutor or as judges, we need to look at diversity as a qualification for those jobs. We need to have judges who can relate mm -hmm. to people of different color. That's a qualification. That's an enrichment of our judiciary um, when they're thinking about sentencing, when they're thinking about whether or not they would give someone probation instead or not. Uh, and likewise, at prosecutor's offices and law enforcement, we need more diversity so that those people can relate to the people that they actually are serving or representing. Yeah, I mean, isn't that, wasn't that a problem with Ferguson? Is that you have a very yeah. white police force that was policing a very African American mm -hmm. population, and then just that disparity was a problem. But it's not something that's limited to when you have a, a disparity like that. I mean, mm -hmm. across the board, uh, minorities are getting stopped by the police more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they get stopped by the police more, they're getting arrested at a higher rate, and then they're getting prosecuted at a higher rate. And it's just like this filtration through the system mm -hmm. that just keeps honing more and more And it just minorities. fulfills itself. It just keeps building upon itself because it allows another officer to say that's a high crime neighborhood, that's a high, and it just, that's probable cause, that's this, and it just, it just kind of keeps coming in a cycle. Yeah, but the law is a tool. Just as we saw with uh, the Civil Rights Act as legislation and then with Brown versus Board of Education, mm -hmm. all of these work together to address the issues. I mean, I can tell you that some people probably can't even imagine that there's discrimination today, depending on where they live. Other people know acutely that there is discrimination mm -hmm. and it's not been that much movement. But the more that we are able to educate one another by talking to one another, by explaining history, by putting things in context, it gives more of us information that we can then assess when things are happening. I just saw it happen in a trial that I had today. And it was an interesting conversation the, to, to watch as they were selecting a jury about how race was possibly a factor in mm -hmm. someone being pulled over and how they may interact with the police because of how they feel that they're going to be mm -hmm. perceived or how mm -hmm. they're actually being perceived. And would that affect how they would way credibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was just an interesting conversation mm -hmm. and as I have sat uh, presiding over trials to watch how race is now a topic that is brought up not in every case because it's not a racial element in every case but those cases that have race as an element how the attorneys are not shying away mm -hmm. from the topic and really having a conversation that even if everyone's not seated on that jury, that they're better informed and they may have those other conversations and it just moves everything mm -hmm. along. So let's go ahead and um, take a little slight detour and talk more specifically about serving on the jury. And the reality is, is that if you are a minority uh, litigant or a minority defendant, there's a very a slim chance that you're gonna you're gonna have seated on your jury a, a person of your race or a minority of any kind, and I see the reason for that is is just the underlying theme that I, I deal with all the time. It's a it's an issue of economics. 
part of the systemic problem is that we don't incentivize jury duty in a way that makes it financially possible and just practically possible for anybody to serve. But if you're poor, it's going to cost you money. Especially if you have children, you're going to have to park in daycare. It's going to cost you money in order to do your civic duty. And so the people that you end up having on juries are the people that have the time um, to sit on a jury. And, and so I think that the pool sort of gets um, narrowed down in a way. So it's not truly reflective of the entire community. Uh, and I've found uh, in the last uh, few years, more and more defense attorneys are discussing race in voir dire and talking about it, bringing it up, making sure that everyone is uh, objective and fair and impartial and that race is not an issue and then letting it go and move on. Uh, my experience has been that even though uh, the juries are 97 or 8 percent uh, white uh, uh, people from this area, uh, my experience is they work very, very hard in coming to a just decision based on the facts and circumstances and not on somebody's background. Obviously, I want to encourage everyone to participate on a jury. It's our civic duty and it's the foundation of our justice system. Now, from the clip that we just saw, there are two different responses. First, Judge Lopez talks about the economics and how that comes into play with people being able to even serve on a jury. And then also that the jury may not be representative of the community and that their decision is normally unbiased and fair, according to Judge Walker. So I'd like to go to our guests for some clarifications on that and your own perceptions. Well, w when I've been in front of juries, um, and particularly if I've had the opportunity to talk to juries afterwards, one thing that's always impressed me is how conscientious they are and how mm -hmm. seriously they take their jobs and also how intelligent they are um, in terms of working together, really taking their civic duty seriously and going over the facts of the case. And they, um, it's, it's really encouraging, even though I, I agree that there are filters and flaws as, as, as with any system, mm -hmm. but ultimately it's, you know, it's one of the great hallmarks of, of our democracy and it's, a, it's kind of encouraging to see despite I guess these flaws and filters. Yeah, uh, you know, let's go to the economic part of it. You know, Judge Lopez was talking about how so many people have a difficult time serving on a jury because it is, you know, they, they take off from their day, they thought their employers mm -hmm. don't pay. So, you know, wh what can we do about that? You know, why is it important to give up that? I, it, it's very difficult because I, you'll see people on both sides of the spectrum have problems with it too. You know, the people who can't afford and the people who feel like their job is too important to leave at the same time. So you, you kind of get this middle ground. Um, I, you know, it's, it's difficult to say. I think, how can we fix that? Um, it's, that's a, a fundamental change in how the system is, because I think now most, it's a, what, $40 a day? It's 25 25 it, No, it's 10 a dollars for the first three days yeah. and then it goes up to 25. Right. Go to overtime, yeah. And yeah. that's not enough at ten dollars a day to pay for parking downtown yeah. and so they that. don't supplement um, by giving you bus passes. So mm -hmm. transportation is on your own and then getting reimbursed. Right. I mean it's essentially a volunteer. It is. It, it's, it's, it's volunteering as a civic duty but it's just that people have to understand that it's the most important you know, they say there's three ways to serve your country, right? You can join the military, mm -hmm. you can vote, and you can serve on a jury. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, serving on a jury, you are, you know, when you vote for president, you're one of 52 million that voted for X, Y, or Z. When you're on a jury, you're one of 12. You're, it's the most important mm -hmm. voice that you'll have as a citizen at that point, the strongest mm -hmm. voice that you'll have by putting in a vote. Uh, so people have to understand that, you know, if you really want your community to be better, you know, you have to go for, you have to volunteer to do that jury duty. It's tough, 
But again, I think as Simon was saying, you know, you it's so engaging. It is. It's mm -hmm. so interesting. It's challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to challenge jurors and get them to believe that they're up for that challenge, mm -hmm. uh, to do things that are a little counterintuitive, to engage in the law, but to affect people's mm -hmm. lives. Um, I so, love that, one in 12, that's yeah. great. W I, one thing jurors actually should understand, their employers should understand, is that um, they cannot be fired for absolutely. leaving their jobs right. to they serve cannot jury duty. Be or, or in any way punished. Right. Absolutely. They cannot be punished. A school cannot drop you from classes. Right. A professor cannot fail you. Uh, you can you cannot suffer consequences for doing jury duty. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the way we have it set up in Multnomah County, people get a jury summons that's for two days or in an asterisk, a jury trial, whichever is longer. But most of the time, people serve one to two days um, and then they're not called for a number of years. And I find that jurors don't have a problem serving on short juries. Mm -hmm. And then it is more difficult for the longer terms, week, multiple weeks, even months, long trials. But you can find those people. There are more employers that pay up to 10 days a year for jury duty. But after that, the pool gets smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Another question I have too along that same lines is, what happens if you, you don't speak it, it's not your first language. You're a citizen, you're a citizen of the United States. You're entitled to serve on the jury, but it's not your, English may not be your, your first language. You know, should you still serve on a jury? Yes. yes. <laughs> Well, it depends Unanimous. on how yes. bad your English is. If you can't understand the proceedings, well, then no. Well, but uh, often people have been here, for, and, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a question that you would assess with, with the, the counsel judge. and the judge. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, if someone is new to the country and they don't navigate the system well and they're not going to be able to understand and fully understand the evidence and fully participate in the deliberations, yes. But if you've been in a country for decades, then you're probably not going to get excused from jury service. Just because you have a Just thick because, accent. Yeah, mm -hmm. a thick accent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, don't you see that too with mm -hmm. people you know, I, I have a mother who has, uh, became a citizen only 10 years ago. So when she came here, a lot of people didn't think she understood, but she actually did. Just because she couldn't speak it well, mm -hmm. doesn't mean she couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. so. so I would say it's a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely important to do it. Because Absolutely. you don't want, you know, you have to think in the, in the justice system, there are civil and criminal cases, right? And so you have people whose lives are being affected in both realms. And many of those people are minorities. Mm -hmm. And to have them be predominantly not judged by their peers necessarily, but just by uh, the majority, as it were, uh, it has a negative effect because they can't relate to what motivated them for whatever decisions that issue, um, some of their thought processes, uh, some of their cultural issues that might be off-putting for someone who's not familiar with that. But so it's extremely important for minorities to engage in the jury system. Well, it might be important, but how do you actually get the individual minority to do it? Like my wife is Korean Japanese. Uh, she's a citizen, but she doesn't want to serve on a jury. She feels her language skills aren't strong enough, even though she and I converse in English. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, so it's just, but I'm going to say that's on her husband to <laughs> so. But it's also how she's going to feel if she's called for a jury and, mm -hmm. and the experience she's having during the jury panel. Right. Uh, I feel like I'm in a unique position mm -hmm. because I actually sat on a jury about two years ago. Really? You, I served, you actually, they I was sat on you. a jury, <laughs> a civil case, <laughs> and I ended up being four person. Of course you were. Well, <laughs> no, but it, it, I ended up being four person because. I was told by my fellow jurors that was going to happen. I was kind of delayed getting in. I was the last, <laughs> next to the last one. And they said, you're the four person. And I said, under certain conditions. And it was a wonderful experience. It confirmed everything that I believed about our legal system, the uh, importance of juries, the confidence I had in the jury deliberation process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was something I could check off my bucket list as well because I know that is never going to happen again. Yeah, no, I, I hope it does. <laughs> I hope it does. It was a wonderful experience. I'm sure. So what I want to say to everyone out there is hopefully the next time you receive a juror summons and you're eligible to participate, we hope that you'll go and exercise your civic duty. 
I think we should take a look at probably a whole other aspect of race and law now. Um, let's talk about the legal profession itself. Um, so let's roll our final clip. I think as a bar, uh, we, we need to encourage and we need to mentor uh, promising lawyers of color uh, for positions on the bench. Most people think of a judge, they think of, you know, an older white male in a robe. Um, and they think of a very traditional path to get there, you know, partner in a law firm or a longtime DA. But I think the lens needs to be different in terms of what qualities can make a good judge. Um, and what qualities do we want to see in the people that are deciding our disputes. As this country grows more diverse, I think it's going to be more important than ever that we add uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds to the judiciary, to the police department. I mean, as you can see, uh, the recent developments uh, in Ferguson, where the police department is 54 members and only three African-American members, and the community is 60% African-American, that's going to create an automatic conflict in the community. It is incredibly important that, uh, that we um, seek out good people of color to fill these seats and these positions. Uh, I would also extend that to our legislature and to our city council. Um, cultivating the minority community that we have now and making sure that they're getting to positions of influence and power getting to the bench so that people can see them, so that they're visible, so that people can say, you know, they look like me and I can do that. Um, I think that's really important. It should be in high school. People should be, I think, thinking about uh, a legal career, either as a police officer or, or an attorney or a judge. I think we have to get people real early thinking about becoming involved in the system. So I saw a statistic the other day that by 2050, this country was going to be mostly a majority of people of color. Uh, and that's going to create quite a, a new look to America, and I think we need to be ready for that. And we need to start right now in the grammar schools. Having a diverse legal community is, it does bring legitimacy to our system. It makes our system better. I think we have a great system, but there's always room for improvement. As these cases are coming into court and the law is being interpreted, it's being interpreted through a social lens and a social context and, and I think that that needs to be reflective of what society really looks like in order to achieve a just result. Welcome back. Well, there seems to be two strands here from the comments. First, encouraging people from all backgrounds to consider the law as a profession. And second, increasing the diversity on our bench. And I'd like to find out what you think about diversity on the bench, diversity in our profession. Well, First of all, there's not enough diversity in the bench or diversity in our professions in Oregon. You're not going to get more diversity on the bench unless you have more diversity mm -hmm. among the lawyers. And there are certain programs in place, like uh, Portland State University has something called the Explore the Law mm -hmm. program. So they have uh, undergraduates that might have not been exposed to lawyers, uh, undergraduates of color who mm -hmm. uh, might be the first student that has mm -hmm. gone to college in their family and uh, the idea of becoming a lawyer seems like unfathomable to them and so there's an encouragement to show them that lawyers are actual real people and to mentor them mm -hmm. and to bring them up and to encourage them to actually go into the law so they can bring back some of the power that lawyers can, can, can yield. Um, or Oregon State Bar has the OLEO, the Opportunity of Law in Oregon program, which mm -hmm. uh, traditionally was for racial minorities, but now has opened up to people who are from mm -hmm. diverse backgrounds. So uh, regardless of your race, if you're the first person that has ever gone to college or if you come from a different socioeconomic mm -hmm. background, then uh, that's something that's considered as well, just to help diversity right. all across the board. Um, I mean, mean, do you think that's helped you? Um, you know, you're a big leader in our community. Has that were you influenced by some of those programs? No, no, because I went to law school <laughs> in New York. <laughs> but um, you've come back now and you mm -hmm. teach at those programs. Uh, I mean, don't I, you inspire others? I, I seriously doubt he that. I'm only, does. I'm only there to he's entertain. Just, I'm not really there humble. to. But, but, but also, you know, there are one of the things that we are trying to do, too, because, you know, Simon and I uh, have worked in the special, what we call the specialty mm -hmm. bars or the minority bars, is we also try to recruit uh, students from other states. You know, when you live in New York, like, you know, or Simon who went to school in New York, it is so diverse that you almost don't think about it. And if you're a person of color and you were applying to a school there, you almost don't, it doesn't affect you because you're going to see many people. And it'll be representative of the population span. 
And then you come to Oregon and you hear these kind of stories. And we, you know, you can't change it unless you change it, right? You can't, it, it, so we need people who are willing to encourage people of diverse backgrounds to come here because it is a great place to live. It is a great place to practice. There are people that will welcome them into the yes. practice. And there are some diverse background judges. We do need more, but it, it is an effort. It's an effort like doing the PSU, like Olio. Yeah, uh, like way. actually, I've actually been on the phone with uh, potential law students who had been mm -hmm. admitted to mm -hmm. a law school here mm -hmm. from another state with a diverse background mm -hmm. to try to encourage them, you know, because I kind of came from another state. So mm -hmm. there, there is a lot of work to do there with is. that. And also even younger than college, there are a number of programs to encourage students of color to consider law mm -hmm. as a potential career path. They can be involved through the Classroom Law Project mm -hmm. in their various mock trials mm -hmm. to try it on, if you will, debate, to see the constitutional debate and see if that's something that you're skilled in. Everyone likes to talk and everyone mm -hmm. likes to win arguments, so you learn different skills. I mean, there are a number of programs that have been throughout the Portland Public School and the greater Oregon community. But for instance, in a professionalism group that I'm in, an in of court that's based on the English system, mm -hmm. the English system, we have adopted Jefferson High School and we have a mock trial program there. There's one at Franklin. There are at other schools that are not traditionally one of those elite schools where you mm -hmm. cannot it's where you can have the same access as other students. And I think that that opens it up. Exposure is a huge factor, as well as seeing someone who looks like yeah. you. you Visualization. Don't have to have, you don't have yeah. to have a personal relationship with that person, but mm -hmm. if someone looks like you, it opens up at least the possibility it could be you too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. And that, Every and lawyer you see yeah. is white, then that's going to be yeah. like, that. that's not a door that's open to me. But the fact that you have people of color that do participate. Here. Yes. And, and, you know, and that's yeah, what I we people watching this program are really going to be very uh, <laughs> yeah. Come on, sorry. No, but when we were talking earlier about our history, and I was saying that I felt kind of blessed. You know, my father's a criminal defense mm -hmm. attorney, uh, and I had met a bunch of other Hispanic attorneys and black attorneys mm -hmm. and Asian attorneys. And then, so I. I now I think coming to Oregon I've realized that they're not they don't really have that here as much and how important mm -hmm. that really is to provide to young you know high school students uh, middle school students to see mm -hmm. a black judge to see Hispanic judges to see Asians you know being mm -hmm. partners at law firms or working at high Absolutely. ranking spots with the governor yeah. or you know at the city that it's important to say that you know people of my people that look like mm -hmm. me that talk like me that like the same food that I do mm -hmm. get to great places uh, and I can too and it, it whether or not they say that to themselves just the hope is is again that visualization mm -hmm. it, what, they may not know it but they're it will help them start believing that whether or not they're told it or not. They just need to see it. The one caveat, no one should go to law school unless they want to be a lawyer. <laughs> Absolutely, because it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Without much gain for and some And young of people, us. would you say, Judge Nelson, I mean, young people can come visit? Anytime. Yeah. Welcome. Isn't the courthouse I, open? The courthouse is a public building, mm -hmm. and all of our proceedings are open to the public. If there is something of a sensitive nature, where we think that it's not appropriate for certain age groups, we will put a sign up on our door. Otherwise, from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, you can come to my courtroom anytime and observe what's going on. Well, I just think it's really important for us to say that not every person of color who's a lawyer or every person of color who's a legal professional may feel that they want to give back or give of themselves because they're managing their own individual lives, which can be a handful for all of us anyway. But those of us who are around the table that want to give and will give, those are the people you access. And it's not because they're trying to further their careers or have someone necessarily think that they're great or not. It's because we believe in the greater good. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to make this Portland, Oregon better. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. 
So I know we've tried to cover a lot of ground today in our discussions, but I'd like to ask each of our panelists what their hopes are for the future, um, kind of segueing into that now. Um, so maybe Simon, start with you. Um, what's your hope for the future? Well, you, know, you just hope things are going to get better. I mean, I think despite the fact that we have problems and we're not there yet, you see through history is just an incremental betterment. I mean, I, I don't think there's a greater illustration of that than what's happening in uh, gender equality right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, there is this backlash, and that's always going to be, that uh, minorities are giving special treatment or that the, you know, the whites are being, you know, kind of hunted down or something like that. And it's like, you just hope that the enlightenment where we have an understanding that we get enriched by diversity is something that that pervades society, but you know maybe that's idealistic. But that's what I hope. Well, you got to have that mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and, and you know, I think I, I the hope for the future is I, I feel like the news. You know, we've reached that fifty-year mark uh, from the civil rights legislation. Fifty years this year. Mm -hmm. And it's there's a sense that things have changed uh, in in the public discourse. Uh, in terms of the tolerance for hate has gone down drastically in our mm -hmm. country. And, um, you know, and I think the discussion about the effect of the drug war, I, I'm seeing things that I feel like I'm latching on to as positive, that people are talking about mm -hmm. the sentencing guidelines, they're talking about the drug war, uh, they're talking, the gender equality is a domino that's, that's just gone, you know, it, it looks like it's, absolutely inevitable uh, in terms of same-sex marriage, for instance. And so... That's the next I'm, civil rights movement. Right. And it, I, it really is. And I just, I'm very hopeful that I, that some changes are made um, and that, you know, the this, this discourse changes to where, again, I think as you were, you were saying, Simon, that diversity is an enrichment. It's a qualification. It, it, it makes, it makes our institutions better. It makes our cities better. It makes our food better. It makes the things that we enjoy better. It does. It makes it makes our art better, and uh, and people need to see that. That's it. Shouldn't just be for uh, the things that you find interesting in life. It should be diversity. Should be in every part of our institutions so that it, it has a, a holistic effect for all of us. So I, I'm hopeful for that, though. I think one day at a time. But it's, I think it's going in the right direction. And, and I too am hopeful as I do a variety of, of professional activities. Most recently, I served on a American Bar Association Commission on Disability Rights where I educated myself about a whole other area of uh, people who have been disenfranchised mm -hmm. and, and, and how inspired I am by mm -hmm. the strength and their uh, tenacity to move forward in a lot of insurmountable odds. I see the commonalities as different groups throughout the year, our history mm -hmm. have been that's the issue on women. This is the issue on blacks that may encompass other areas. Mm -hmm. this, this is immigration. This mm -hmm. is same sex. When we realize that we are more the same than different, and that the differences are an enhancement, it's an enrichment, and that we all are working toward the same goal, that we can make this a better place. And also acknowledging that we understand that the legal system is not without its flaws. Mm -hmm. It's imperfect, but it's the best legal system in the world, and we need to work together to improve it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all for your insights and for sharing your experiences with us today. It's very much appreciated. Um, well, we've still got plenty to discuss, but we must draw to a close. So I want to thank my guests once again. Um, yes, we have come a long way, but in order for our legal system to be truly reflective of the communities they serve, we must encourage diversity and engage people in our legal system. Our nation is only going to grow more diverse, and now it is more important than ever that we inspire each other to build a system that embodies these principles. In essence, and I'm going to take these words from Judge Nelson, a more inclusive, a more just, and a more perfect union. I'm Bonnie Richardson. Thank you for watching Legal Logic.